Okay, welcome. This is Christian Bible Chapel, and we thank you for coming, being with us. Amen. We started real late, but we thank and praise God for our grandsons coming over, and, and we uh, fellowship and we praise God. Today, we want to pick up on part two of our lesson on the second coming of Jesus Christ, and we want to go deeper into the teaching concerning death and punishment. Let's go to God in a word of prayer. Father, we thank you for uh, the power of the Holy Spirit that works in the lives of all Christians. Help us, dear God, to study to show ourselves approved unto you. Help us, dear God, to allow the Holy Spirit to teach us the word of God. Raise up men who will teach sound teaching the word of God that will uh, on their own study the word of God and be able to feed the flock of God, feed the people of God, searching the scriptures that the scriptures may interpret the scriptures. And that's what we want to do, Lord. Now bless us, Lord, in your mighty name, through the power of the Holy Spirit, who is the author of the word of God. In Jesus' name, amen. Now turn in your Bibles to St. John chapter 14. Now, I know that this to some may be a very difficult uh, subject to, 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 to grasp, but it shouldn't be because we're, we're heavily leaning on, on scriptures. Scripture must interpret scripture. And this is what we've been trying to get uh, all Christians everywhere that listen to Christian Bible Chapel to learn how to put aside our differences, put aside our traditions and our denominationism and our labels and look into what the scripture says. And that's one of the remarkable things about the Bereans in the book of Acts. They searched the scriptures. They search the Old Testament scriptures wherein Paul was preaching because the majority of his sermons were, were, were pulled out of the Old Testament and much of it, some of it was also a mystery or new concerning the church. All right. But we see in St. John chapter 14, let's, let's turn to that, St. John chapter 14, verses uh, 1 to uh, 4. Let's go there. Let's read. It says, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God. Believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you, and if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there ye may be also. Now, the tremendous part about this particular scripture is that right now, what Jesus is calling his disciples to do is to really trust him to trust him because he was about to be taken away from them. So Jesus laid it on them and let them know that in the past, as Jewish people, you have believed in God the Father, who is Jehovah God. You put your trust in him. What he said in his word, you believed him. I'm talking about the faithful Jews, those who stick with the covenant of Abraham, the covenant of David, and now the New Testament. So, but, but Jesus is saying, you trust in God. I want you now with that same trust, all right, to trust in me. I want you to lay aside all your doubts. I want you to lay aside all your mishaps and any uh, confusion. And I want you to heavily to trust in me because I'm going to give you a promise. And that promise is, is that, and I cannot lie, Titus 1 and 2, Hebrews chapter 6, it is impossible for God to lie. Now, what Jesus says is that I'm going away. I will die. Now, remember, he has repeatedly, numerous of times, telling the disciples, that he's going to Jerusalem, he's going to be mocked, he's going to be scourged, he's going to be handed over to the Gentiles, they're going to kill him. 
but on the third day, he's going to rise again. Now, the reason why he did that is to portray that I have to fulfill all what was written of me, Luke chapter 24, verse 40 through 48. Now, he says, I have to fulfill all that. Now, in order for me to fulfill redemption, to bring about redemption, to fulfill the promise, I must die, be buried, and rise again. Now, Jesus says that, now remember throughout the scriptures, he's been saying, I am the resurrection. I am the good shepherd. I am the way, the truth, and the life. Now, each one of those, he proclaimed, Jehovah God also said the same thing in the Old Testament. So Jesus is the fulfillment of God in flesh of the Old Testament. And so therefore, he's telling them that let not your heart be troubled. I want you to believe in me just as you believe in the Father. Now, he's using this allegory of how that when a, a person, when, when, when a fam, two families come together and make a covenant agreement with their children for them when they grow up that they will get married. It starts at a young age for the children. And as they grow and as they grow until they reach the age of maturity, all right, each one was separated from each other, betrothed. That was one act or process of being marriage in the Jewish custom. And they had to stay away from each other. And by faith, they had to trust each other that there is going to be no fornication, no messing around, no drunkenness, no, no sinning towards each other while they are away from each other. Until that moment in which the bridegroom would go, come back, and receive his bride and take her to the father's house. That means that the bridegroom will go to the bride's house where she was still living with her father and take her out of that home and take them, the bridegroom would take her out of the home and take her to the father's, his father's house. In my father's house are many mansions. See, while the bridegroom was away from the groom, or the bride, rather, excuse me. Um, the bridegroom, the man, was busy making preparations for living quarters for his betrothed wife. All right. Now, the time came at the final stage of marriage they were to be finally brought together ceremonially and pronounced husband and wife. He was to take his bride to his father's house. Now you can imagine how long, many of months and maybe years separated them. That's the allegory that the church is going through right now. We, we are physically, not spiritually, physically separated from Jesus. Jesus is in heaven. All right. We are on earth. All right. He's coming back to receive his bride. This is what John chapter 14 is all about. I go to prepare a place for you. And since I go to prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there ye may be also. Now, let's take this a little bit further here. He says, in my father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go, I will come again. It takes strong faith. Remember Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1. Now, faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Now, let's go through it a little bit further in the second coming of Christ in dealing with death and punishment. 
a promise is made from Christ. And that promise is all who are saved will never perish. All who believe in me will never perish. All who are saved will experience a resurrection unto life while all those who are not saved would experience a resurrection and eternal punishment. Now, either it's going to be eternal life or eternal punishment. Right? Let, let's deal with that for a while now, since we are, we're talking about that. Death. The opposite of death is life. If death is in contrast to life, it is the opposite of life. Now, it's, it's, death is not another kind of life. You don't die and go to another life or you go to another existence because that devolves the word, the meaning for death, because death means to be deceased. I had it on the board. I erased it. it. It means that you're dead. You're gone. Your body dies. Death is not life. See, when you die, death is death. Death is not life in heaven. Death is not life in hell. Death is not life or experiences in purgatory or Hades. It is not life of any kind anywhere because death is death. See, if we, if we say we die and we go somewhere, then you're not dead. You're still alive. That voids the meaning of the word death. You follow me? All right. Nothing new. The scriptures are saying. It's not everlasting life with torment. Not a change of mode of existence. Death is not life in another condition. It's not life separated from God. Death doesn't mean separate. To be separated from God. Death means you're dead. You cease to exist. That's the physical death. All right. Now, when we look at these uh, passages of scriptures, which we're going to look at, we need to know that death does not mean there's a separation of a body and a soul. Because if that's true, then you continue to live, to exist. That boards the meaning of the word death. I follow me now. Death does not mean there is a separation of body and soul and the soul goes up or the soul goes down. We, we discussed that Wednesday in Ecclesiastes chapter 3, verse 20 and 21. At death, there is no separation. For death is death. Death is death. And, and we got to realize this or we're going to not trust in Jesus Christ, his promise. Right. Now, in, in our notes here, what we're dealing with, now I don't want to talk about uh, what is man yet. I'm, I'm going to wait till Monday uh, to talk about the subject, what is man. All right. So we're going to stay on uh, the meaning of the word death. In the Bible, in Romans chapter 8, verse 13, it says, if you live according to the flesh, you will die. Romans 8, 13. But if by the spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, and the only way you can put to death the deeds of the body, the deeds of the body, the controlling of sin in your body is to be born again. you will live. So either you're going to die or you're going to live. Now, 
Remember the scripture says in John, in Romans chapter 6, I don't have it on the board, Romans 6, 26, 23, I'm sorry, for the wages of sin, for the punishment of sin, is not life. Now, list, follow the word of God instead of your upbringing, your denominationism, your labels, your conditions, your feedback, your desires, your emotions, your traditions. For the wages of sin is what? Death. It's not life somewhere. You don't See, the whole point to prepare a place for you. And if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come. The Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout. See, the, the, the hope of the believer is not death because death, 1 Corinthians 15, is our enemy. The hope of the believer is to be with Jesus Christ. And the only way we can be with Jesus Christ is to experience the resurrection of the body. Apart from the there is no life. For, for if you have trusted Jesus Christ. Now let me let me let me make that very plain. Because people will say, see, with the resurrection, there is life. Well, let me tell you one thing. In the scriptures, the scriptures only describe a living condition of eternal bliss, eternal life, eternal joy, eternal happiness, if only you have repented of your sins and trust Jesus Christ as Savior. That is called the resurrection of life the resurrection of the just, the resurrection of the righteous. Why is it called just, righteous, of the saved, of life? Because you're going to experience throughout eternity immortality and incorruption. First Corinthians, wherein the unbeliever will not experience that. They will experience eternal punishment, eternal death. Now remember, death is you cease to be, all right? You cease to be. You're gone. There's no thoughts, there's no love, there's no hatred, there's no knowledge. Ecclesiastes chapter 3, chapter 9, chapter 12. This is what the scripture teaches. Because the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life. So you have death, which is the punishment for sin, and then you have a gift of God, which is eternal life. You can't have both. No unbeliever will ever experience eternal existence because you cannot be eternally have existence without knowing God. That's eternal life. No believe, unbeliever has eternal life. So if you say you're going to exist somewhere after judgment, or after death, it voids the word death, it voids the word resurrection, and then there's no need for a resurrection if you are still, if you are now possessor of an immortal soul, or you going to exist somewhere after the judgment. Now I know this, this is, this may be uh, kind of hard to to grasp and because we was brought up under that once you die you separate and you go to a place whether it's torment or heaven 
And I know that it's, it's, it's been engraved in our minds. But you see, when Jesus died, he didn't go to hell. He didn't go to heaven. He didn't go to paradise. He didn't go anywhere. The scripture says, as, jo as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the whale, so shall the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the, in the heart of the earth. Now, that denotes this. Let's turn in our Bibles. See, we're not even, we're also noting how Creed, it says, he descended into hell. Now, watch that now. The Apostle Creed, he says, it says, he was born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell the third day he rose from the dead. But did he? No, because the scriptures proves that he did not. You look at Acts chapter 2. Let's look at Acts chapter 2 very quickly here. Acts chapter 2, verse 22 says, Ye men of Israel, Hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man proved of God among you by miracles and wonders and signs. These things authenticate that he is the Messiah, which God did by him in the midst of you, and ye yourselves also know. Him, Jesus of Nazareth, being delivered by the determined counsel and foreknowledge of God, note that, you have taken by wicked hands and killed him, crucified and slain. Notice this. Whom God raised up, having loosed the pains of death, because it was not possible that he should be holden of it. Let me repeat that. Acts chapter 2, verse 24 whom God raised from the dead, whom God raised up, having loosed the pains of death. Now see, his body went in the grave. They put him in the sepulchre, right? Because it was not possible that he should be hold of death. He de Jesus defeated death. Follow me now. Follow. For David, verse 25, speaks concerning Christ, the Messiah. I foresaw the Lord also always before my face, for he is on my right hand that I should not be moved. This is quoting from Psalms 10, or 16, I'm sorry. Therefore did my heart rejoice, my tongue was glad, and moreover, also, my flesh shall rest in hope. My flesh, my body, shall rest in hope. Because you will not leave me, in the King James, the, the word is soul, you will not leave me in the grave. Neither will you suffer your Holy One to see corruption. So David is prophesying here how that Jesus laying in the tomb, the grave, in the King James, the word is used, hell. And that's why we assume in our English versions that he went to hell. And that's why the writers of the Apostle Creed, which is not inspired by God. No creed is inspired by God. No catechism is inspired by God. No confession is inspired by God. Only the word of God is inspired. God breathed. But they sought to use the words soul and hell in the English translations of many English translations, which we have succumbed to believe 
that Jesus went to hell. Wherein the word itself in the Hebrew is Shiloh, C S H E O L, which is the grave. The grave, which collides with the Son of Man shall be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. The grave. He was in the grave. You will not suffer your Holy One to see corruption. See, corruption is when the body dies, it begins to deteriorate and turn back to dust. Before that process began its course after the fourth day, fifth day, Jesus rose from the dead. The scripture goes on and says, you have made known to me the ways of life. You shall make me full of joy with your countenance. Men and brethren, this is important. Men and brethren, let me freely speak unto you of the patriot David, that he is both dead and buried, and his sepulcher is with us until this day. It did not say that David was in paradise. It did not say that David was in Abraham's bosom. It did not say that David was in heaven, but it says David is right now both dead and buried, and his grave, sepulchre, is with us until this day. The resurrection of the just, the resurrection of the righteous demands a body to get out of the grave. To it, in order to experience immortality and eternal life. The resurrection of the unjust, of the wicked, demands also a body to be raised, to be judged, and to be sentenced to the second death. First death, physical. Second death, the body is coming out of the earth to be judged, faced by Jesus Christ, and to die the second time. That's the second death. A death that there will be no resurrection, no reprieve, no coming back. See, the, the, the best way to acknowledge, uh, 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 examine this is when a body dies, it ceases to function. It has no contact with anything, anybody. It has no feelings. It has no thoughts. It has no love, it has no hatred, it has no memory. The body is dead. In the second death, see, in that, let me, before I say that, in that first death, when the body dies, which many of us will escape because of Jesus' second coming. And that's why Paul says, see, that's why it is a mystery, it is a new thing. Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all die, but we shall all be changed in a moment, in a twinkle of an eye. That deals with the regenerated, the born-again believers, the Christians. Now, when John chapter 5 says, the, I be marvel not at this, for the hour is coming, which all are in the grave shall hear his voice. They that have done good unto the resurrection of righteous or just, they that done evil or wicked to the resurrection of damnation or judgment. The unrighteous will face a second death. Whosoever name was not found written in the book of life was sentenced to the lake of fire. John says this is the second death. The second death is when you are put to death, you die having no hope of ever coming back, ever being raised up. That is your punishment. 
it's not an eternal existence somewhere because you still be alive. To exist throughout eternity in torment or somewhere in purgatory or limbo or whatever means that you're still existing and so therefore you have immortality. And immortality is not granted to any unbeliever after the judgment. I hope you can understand this. I hope you can see this. Now, this is the reason why Jesus says, I want you to put all your confidence in me. I want you to put your faith in me. When you die, I will be with you. Do not worry about anything because I'm coming back. I'm coming back to receive you. Whether you are dead or alive, I'm coming back to receive you. I'm coming back to get my bride. My bride is not with me right now. No bride, no part of the bride, the church, is with Jesus now. See the allegory. The, 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 the wife, the betrothed woman, is not with the bridegroom helping him build a house or pray, build a house next to his father's house. The bride is still there with her father, cross town in another village in another town, waiting patiently, patiently by faith, keeping herself pure until her husband, which is the bridegroom, comes to get her. This is the analogy, John chapter 14. Now, let me go to the page now. When we think of death, we think of as humans because we need our faith to be broadened to the point that when we die, Jesus one day will come and get us. And it takes tremendous faith. So why would he say, I go to prepare a place for you? What's the point? If you're right there with him when you die. When Jesus Christ comes back with the voice of an archangel, the trump of God, he's bringing back with him the hope, the promise that he promised to come back to redeem the purchase of his possession, Romans chapter 8. It's not, see, the scriptures let us know throughout Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and John, that he's coming back with his hagios, angels, holy ones. What we have interpreted is that we change that word once again, from Hagios to saints instead of angels, which is he's coming back with his angels. So anytime you hear, read in the scriptures that he's coming back with saints, that Greek word is Hagios, it is angels, not saints, because you're messing up the scriptures. The wicked will be punished, but their punishment is eternal death. That's why the punishment is eternal. It is everlasting because you're not coming back ever again. So when Jesus uses these words in Matthews in particular, when he talk about punishment, Matthew 25, 46, that's what he's talking about. It's not punishing, it's punishment. Follow me. I want to take my time because it is very crucial because we cannot mess up the word perish, destroy, destruction, eternal destruction, 
consumed so what is eternal is it punishment the punishment is eternal or is it punishing matthew 25 46 let's look at that let's let's read that for the wages of sin is death it doesn't say punishment it doesn't say torture it doesn't say torment it says punishment. The wages of sin is punishment. It's death. The punishment of sin is death. Romans 6, 23. Death and punishment. Romans 6, 23 for the wages. So you see, when we look at the word, follow me on the board here, okay? We see the word perish. I give unto them eternal life, and they shall never perish. We look at the word destroy. Fear not him that is able to destroy the body, but him that's able to destroy both soul and body. So you look at that in Matthew. 1028. Again, the Greek has to be understood. The word soul there is not an immaterial, invisible part that is in you. It is the life. So God is able to destroy the life and the body, okay, in death, which is the second death. See, for so long, the church has been caught up in tradition in accepting the afterlife teaching, mixing it with reincarnation, mixing it with Egyptians, Babylonians, Chaldeans, Assyrians, Phoenicians, Greeks, Romans, philosophies of Plato, Socrates, and other religions and other philosophies. And it has caught us off guard that we really think that we are within our bodies, we have something immortal. Now, Monday, Monday morning, we're going to come back and teach on what is man. And we're going to travel from Genesis all the way through from Genesis chapter 1, 2, 3, and chapter 6 and chapter 9 of Genesis and show you through various scriptures and Joshua chapter 10 and other passages of scriptures about what is man. But perish does not mean, if Jesus says you're going to perish, we must not assume that you're going to be existing somewhere perishing. It, it doesn't make sense. He's going to, he, you're going to be destroyed perish. I give unto them eternal life, and they shall never perish. John 10, 28. If you believe not that I am he, John chapter 8, you shall die in your sins. To die in your sins does not mean you're going to live somewhere else. Because if for you to live someone else, somewhere else after death, that messes up a lot of scriptures. So pointing them to men wants to die, but after death, judgment. I know, I know, I know. Some of the great leading theologians and preachers are still preaching it and still teaching it, and it's been passed on down. But all is time for the child of God to really study the word of God and see what the scripture says and stop taking at face front what you have received when you first got into church or first got saved. And that's what's happening. Search the scriptures. If you, if you experience eternal torment, if you experience eter eternal torment, then that means you're still existing. I 
hope you can feel it or see it or understand it. You're experiencing eternal torment. And this is wrong. Immortality is only granted to those who have trusted Jesus Christ by faith, who have repented of their sins. If you have not, you will perish. You will be destroyed. You will be, let's look at another one. You will be consumed. Okay? There's destruction. There's destruction awaits you. So you see, you perish, you destroy, you consumed destruction. Where in the scriptures that these words is that it's a continuation of? Because the meaning of each one, even in the Old Testament, when something perished or was destroyed or consumed, it was gone. Why do we wait to the New Testament to understand that these words mean that, oh, you're still going to be alive. You shall not surely die. That's the lie that Satan has passed on down. And he's the father of all lives. So when the scriptures lets us know that death is death, that death is death, death is not life. It is not an existence beyond death. You cannot live beyond death somewhere. That is incredible. Okay? That is incredible. Now, we see here in the scriptures about punishment. We said we was going to go to Matthew chapter 26, verse 46. And let's read that. All right, let's read that. Matthew 6, 46. I'm sorry, Matthew's 25, 46. Ooh, I gotta get this right now. Okay, here we go. All right, not only verse 46, but let's drop back to verse 41, then 46. Matthew's chapter 25, verse 41 and 46. 41 says, then Jesus says to them on the left hand, depart from me, ye cursed, into everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. Then you have to understand what the word fire means. Because for so long, we are identifying ourselves with the word fire, like the fire on the stove or in the campfire, which is not. Then you look at verse 46. And these shall go away into everlasting punishment, but the righteous into life eternal. So let's take for granted that you do exist after you judge. You do exist having a, a everlasting punishment, not punishing, but punishment. But it's taken for punishing because the more you stay in torment, you're being punishing. You're being punished by God. For calm's sake, let's just say that is true. Well, if that is true, then that means you're still existing. For me, for anyone, not me, but for anyone who die outside of Christ in their sins, if they say they perish, destroy, consume, or destroy, it's not really so because you're still existing. So everlasting punishment is that you're still existing 
somewhere being tormented or you, you still alive. So the point of the matter is, watch this now. If you are still existing somewhere in torment forever and ever, you're still existing. That means you still have immortality because immortality means you never die. If you never die, then the meaning is death is, you have to change the meaning to the word death. Either death is death or death or, or, or is life. Death means you cease to, you cease to exist, you're gone, you're not coming back. You don't think, you don't have no knowledge, you don't have no memory, you don't have no thoughts, nothing, you're dead. In the second death, you experience the same thing as the physical death, but you just don't come back. In the first death, the physical death, you are raised up from the grave, face your judgment, and you die the second death. The second death is not torment. The second death is you're not coming back again. You're forever gone. So he says, these shall go away into everlasting punishment, but the righteous into etern life eternal. Many say punishment must last as long as life. If, it, if, if punishment lasts as long as life, then it's equal to life, and therefore it is, you still have immortality. But this does not say what the punishment is. It is a question of whether the punishment is an eternal life of torment or eternal death. The punishment is not to be forever dying or is not forever living separated from God. It is forever being dead. You're not dying you're not being tormented, you're dead. Just like the first death, you're dead. Until the resurrection of the righteous or the unrighteous. The only point of different between the second death, Revelation chapter 20, verse 15, whosoever name was not found written in the book of life was sentenced to the second death. That's the lake of fire is that you forever will be dead. See, what has happened is that we have taken the lake of fire as our lake, like Lake Missouri, Lake Michigan, a body of water. But what we have described the lake of fire as a lake of fire. Literally, we have made the lake of fire a lake of fire. I know I've repeated myself, but that's the only way to get you to understand. And this is not what the Bible is saying. John tells us what the lake of fire is. He, he says that I, this is not my writing. This is not my interpretation. John, see, scripture interprets itself. I don't need to interpret it. We follow the scriptures from scriptures to scriptures. So when John says in Revelation chapter 20, I'm getting it real fast here. Follow me here. Now let's go to Revelation 20, verse 11. Revelation chapter 20, verse 11, is the fulfillment of John chapter 5, when he says, all that are in the grave shall hear his voice. They that have done good unto the resurrection of unrighteous or the wicked. This is what this is. The reason why Paul, James, John, Peter, and Luke in the New Testament or the writers of the Old Testament does not give a very descriptive understanding of the, un, the unrighteous, unrighteous or the wicked is because there is none. They're dead. 
There is no hope for them. There's no joy. There's no eternal life. This is the reason why the Old Testament and the New Testament is full of descriptive words concerning believers who receive the Messiah, Jesus Christ, as Lord and Savior through repentance of their sins. John says, I saw a great white throne and him that sat on it. Now my mind goes to also that we misinterpret two passages of scriptures. First, the thief on the cross. Second, Luke chapter 16, which we have interpreted wrong. Now, I, I, it's nothing new. I'm not starting anything new. You interpret the scriptures with the scriptures. In Luke's gospel, starting in chapter 10, all the way to chapter 16, they are parables. And each time he speaks of a certain man had two sons. A certain man had a vineyard. A certain rich man had that. A certain see, it's, it's, he's giving the parables from Luke 10 all the way up to 16, how that God has blessed Israel with the riches and the grandeur and the word of God, the gospel with the word of God, and how they need to share it with the Gentiles who are dogs. But they didn't. And that's repeated in each parable in the gospel of Luke. So what we have done is that we have changed the wordings. We have made Luke 16, 19 to 31 as the hell fire scriptures. In hell, he lifted up his eyes in hell, being in torment and saying, Father Abraham. And, 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 and looking at these scriptures, it has nothing to do what the modern day preaching of what we call hell today. We're leaving the context to fulfill a traditional teaching in which the scriptures know nothing about. The thief on the cross. Remember earlier he was um, uh, railing Jesus, calling him this and that and saying, if you're the Christ, take us, get us down. Then all of a sudden he came to himself and say, uh, uh, Lord, remember me when you get into your kingdom. Jesus said, I don't have a kingdom. My kingdom is not of this earth. I didn't come to get a kingdom. I came to seek and to save that which is lost. I come to save sinners. I didn't come to establish a kingdom. I didn't come to be a Caesar. I didn't come to be an emperor. You know, so the dying thief rejoiced to see it. That's wrong. It's wrong. He died in his sins. Stop using the metal, the, the, the example of the thief on the cross. He wasn't baptized. He didn't, he didn't speak in tongue, and yet he went to heaven. Who said he went to heaven? Read the scriptures closely. Well, you say, well, preacher, he did say, Jesus did say, today you shall be in paradise with me. But that goes back to the scriptures. Jesus, when he died, did not go to paradise. Well, explain why Jesus said to the thief, today you shall be with me in paradise. What? It's nothing to explain. It's a question. We have made it to a statement. Watch this. Listen, listen to how I read that scripture, or quote it at least. Today, you shall be with me in paradise. That's a statement. Now, in the Greek, read. listen to how it reads in the Greek. Today, you shall be with me in paradise. See the difference? They, no, Jesus, see, we just went to Acts chapter 2, Psalms chapter 16, and many other scriptures that teaches that. 
that Jesus did not hold it, Mary. Don't touch me. I have not ascended into my father. What are we going to do with those scriptures? If those scriptures are saying that, and we're saying that Jesus went to paradise or died and went to hell, then the scriptures is contradicting themselves. We need to stop and think and study the scriptures because something is wrong. Either he went to hell, paradise, Abraham bosom, or he stayed in the grave, or did he go to heaven? Which one? Where did Jesus go? But the scripture says he went to the grave, and he stayed there for three days and three nights. Then someone says, well, the scripture says in Luke 21 or 22, he went to paradise because he said, today you shall be with me in paradise. But then in Luke chapter 16 is Abraham's bosom. We need to study and stop following seminary professors, lectures that is not yielding to the guidance of the sound teaching of the scriptures. Now, I'm not saying who you're not saved. No, perish the thought. I, I cannot judge anyone. But we must preach and teach the word of God. Number one, you are saved by grace through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Nothing you can say or do. You don't beg God at the altar. You don't you don't speak in tongues. You don't wobble on the floor. You don't see a dream, a vision. You don't say the sinner's prayer of repentance. It's not in that. It's simply being drawn by the Spirit of God. He overwhelms you and calls conviction upon you. He changes your dispensation, disposition of your heart and your mind, which causes you to hear the gospel right and receive the gospel and cry out for Christ to save you that whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. But we still need to know that the wicked will be judged for their sins and their punishment is death, the second death. That punishment is you will perish, you will be destroyed, you will be consumed, you will be destroyed, you're dead. It covers that. Now we can we can you know be full of our uh, theological, institutional, and hammer it and say you're wrong, you're wrong, you're wrong. The Bible does teach this and this and this and that, but that's okay. But I tell you what, as Christians, we shall know when Jesus comes back. We need to preach the gospel that people may come to know Jesus Christ as Savior because if they die in their sins, they're going to face the punishment which is after judgment and it will be the second death, not a burning, roaming lake of fire throughout eternity, but the second death. And the scripture tells us here in this scripture in Revelation, when it says, verse 14, and death and the grave was cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. Did you see that? Did you read that there? The lake of fire is the second death. It's not a warbling, burning sulfur of fire and brimstones that a person exists in torment throughout eternity. But we have accepted that. And therefore, we frighten people to get saved. We scare people to get saved. And that's not the way to get people to be saved. It's the preaching of the gospel. Sure, we tell people they're going to be judged for their sins. Sure, we tell people they're going to be punished by God because the wages of sin is death. The punishment of sin is death. Sure, we tell people that. But we need to tell them also that they are a sinner and they are lost. They need to repent of their sins and confess it before God and cry out to him for salvation. And whosoever was not found written in the book of life was sentenced to the lake of fire. 
Because the lake of fire, there has already been told by John, is the second death. It's a it, the second death is when you die and you never come back again. It's not dying, tormenting, punishing your dead. Just like the first death. It's remarkable. I know, I know. It's, 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 we, we, we follow traditions of men, then, then we follow the scriptures. So, eternal punishment, eternal punishment is the second death not life somewhere else. You sound like being in Hades. You sound like the Greek gods, the Roman gods. You sound like being mummified like the Egyptians that believe in uh, transmigration and rebirth and, 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 and mummification and afterlife. You, you sound like a Roman that, you know, you, you, know, you have to put a coin on your mouth in order to pay for your toll through Hades. And when you get there, you have to struggle through Hades. And if, you, if you've if done some good deeds, your, your suffering won't be too, too heavy. Sound like purgatory, doesn't it? Eternal life or eternal death. No believer will be punished. No believer will be judged for their sins. No believer, because all of our sins, as a believer in Christ, every sin that you had done before you got saved, every sin that you are, will do in this mortal flesh, has already been forgiven through the blood of Jesus Christ. His death on the cross paid for your past, present, and future sins. There is therefore now no condemnation to them that are in Christ Jesus. So if a believer in Christ is caught in a sin when the rapture takes place, they're still going to be with Jesus because that sin has been forgiven. But the unbeliever will face the judgment of God and their works and their sins and their mouth and their words and everything will be brought out in the books. They will be judged and they will be sentenced to the second death. No more to come back. They will not come back. In the physical death, you come back in the resurrection. But in the second death, there's no coming back. Now, to conclude this, what we see is what we see here. We see that life exists in this body. Prasuki, that's life, natural life. When this body dies, the scripture teaches that the body goes back to the dust. But life in every creature, in every creature that breathes, life, will, when they die, that life, whether it's a bird, whether it's a beast, whether it's a man, whether it's a monkey, a tiger, a caterpillar, or whatever, it goes back to God. But zoe, which is eternal life, is only granted to those who have repented of their sins and trust Jesus Christ as Savior. Now, Monday, when we come back, Lord's willing, when we come back Monday, we are going to look at what is man. We're going to begin to start at Genesis 1 
chapter 1, and go right through to Genesis 9, pulling out scriptures that teaches what Ecclesiastes 3, 9, and 12 is talking about, that man is a living being. It's not that he has a soul. He is a soul, not nephesh. We're going to look at that Greek word, nephesh, N-E-H-P-H-E-S-H. -E -E Let me spell it again, N-E-H-P-H-E-S-H, -E nephesh. It means creature, living creature, living being. And we're going to see from Genesis 1 all the way up to Genesis 9. We're going to look at Joshua chapter 10 and other passages of Scripture as we bring it to a conclusion about the punishment once again. So those who perish are unbelievers. Those who do not perish are believers. Those, the wicked, will have their end. And the word end means they will come to the point in which God, they will face God at the judgment for their sins. We are not mortals. I'm um, excuse me, we are not immortal. There's nothing about us immortal. There's nothing inside us that is immortal. Nothing but flesh and bone. As Paul said in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, he says, Brethren, flesh and blood shall not inherit the kingdom of God. He did not say flesh and blood and the soul. He said flesh and blood shall not inherit the kingdom of God. We're going to look at that Monday as the Lord leads us. Again, as we close. Listen to the statement. The question is, is the wages of sin an actual eternal life of torment, or is the wages of sin is death? You must understand what's the difference. There is a difference. You got to understand that death, whether it's physical or whether it's the second death, you cease to exist. You are dead. You have no memory. You are not breathing. You don't lo no longer hate love. You cannot see. You cannot talk. You're dead in that cassock, in that grave. The second death, same thing. One thing about the first death is you coming back in that resurrection to be judged, and then to be sentenced to that second death, wherein you will never, ever come back again. Let's look to the Lord in prayer. Father, we thank you for the blessed word of God. Help us to study the scriptures. Help us to put aside our denominations, teachings, our precepts, our traditions, our emotions, our feelings, our theology, and see what the scriptures has us to see. May we get into the scriptures as believers in Christ so that our faith in you will trust you that at the moment of death, you're still with us. And that when you come back, you will rise us up from the dead to spend eternity with you with an immortal, incorruptible body. Blessed be the name of God, and we thank you. We warn, as Paul says, every unbeliever, unrighteous, that they need to repent of their sins and trust Jesus Christ as Savior before this awful, awful fate that comes upon them, the punishment of sin. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.
Monday morning, Lord's willing, at 9 o'clock, we're coming back with the subject, What is Man? What is Man? God bless.